Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So let me introduce myself. I am an alcoholic. I appreciated hearing our inclusion statement, our membership statement in the pamphlet that was read in accordance with our third tradition. I have a desire not to drink. So I am indeed an alcoholic. Um, My name is Ashley and I have a home group. Uh, I have a sobriety date. Let me give you that first. It's the 30th of December, 2006. I like to say I'm pretty fond of my sobriety date and I'm not planning on giving it up anytime soon. Uh, It is my only sobriety date. That does not make me good, right, and perfect. It does mean um, that the 12 steps work. And I have chosen with the grace and help of my higher power um, and based on the decision I made in step three, not to pick up a drink. And I'm going to keep it that way. My uh, sobriety date is also my papa's birthday. He was an alcoholic. And I think that it's a little bit of a wink and a nod from him, you know, and I don't want to throw that back in God's face. So I'm going to hang on to my sobriety date with the help of this program and my higher power. And I have a sponsor. I think she's here with me today, which makes me a little excited and abashed and humble and nervous. And, you know, one of my uh, mentors in this program, Granny Pat, who has a lot of time from West Texas, said, if I'm nervous, it's just my higher power shaking the truth out of me. And um, I, some women I have the privilege of sponsoring are also here today. So it's really good to be in community and to be in fellowship. And the way I understand it is the fellowship is the first word of the first step, the we, the community of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it's really good to be with everybody. Um, so my home group, the Beacon Group, the information is going to be put in the chat. And I heard someone's looking for a, a home group. So come check us out. We meet Monday through Friday on Zoom uh, at noon Eastern, and we're really a solution-based group. I don't know about y'all, but I lived in the problem for a long time. And if you wonder what the problem is, in addition to drinking, I'll just read what we sometimes call um, the the bedevilments. Well, I'll read them later because we're going to talk about the problem and how the possible becomes the impossible becomes possible. But I lived with a lot of problems, including deep emotional problems. Um, and so at the at at our home group, we someone reads the step from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and shares their experience with applying that step and the solution to their life for about 30 minutes. And then we break into small groups and everyone in their small group has the chance to share on that step and reflect on what they heard the speaker say. And it's a very principled uh, group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we also meet on Mondays and Wednesdays hybrid. And that information is now in the chat. And we'd love to have you with us. Um, I don't get to my home group as often as I could or should And that's a recommitment I am making. Um, My partner and I travel a great deal. We spend part of the year in Africa where the program is portable. I live in the rainforest in a tent and I just take my literature and my higher power with me. And then I'm also in Berlin and Switzerland and Tennessee and Cambridge. And, you know, I just have, and as as I said, the program is portable and it works under all causes and all conditions. Um, So I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the first thing that becomes possible in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is not to pick up a drink, you know, not to pick up a drink. And oh my gosh, for an alcoholic, you know, how how does that happen? Um, I was pretty obsessed with alcohol. You know, it lived rent-free between my two ears and I am a high bottom alcoholic. You know, I was obsessed with white wine, with pink champagne. And when a glass was carried into the room on that pretty tray with the with the waiter, you know, it was like the Hollywood Klieg lights clicked on and shone on it. And it, it just loomed large in my imagination. Everything else in the room receded, the volume went down and it's all I saw. And it was all I wanted. And I got real thirsty and I would, you know, in my imagination, knock people out of the way to get over there and, and get that drink in my mouth. Because as it says in our book, in the doctor's imagination, I took that first drink and I got a sense of ease and comfort. And I, I, I once ate in sobriety, a dessert um, in which alcohol had been an ingredient. And I didn't know that alcohol had been an ingredient cooked into this dessert. It was at my house on my back porch with my chosen family, all of whom are in recovery. We do these, we call them picnic 
and we have one every Sunday and everyone gathers. And my, my sis, chosen sister, Tammy, who's the dessert gal brought this, this treat and I ate it and everyone else just ate it. But what I felt was the alcohol and it just went straight through me into my stomach and warmed my tingling limbs to my fingertips and my toes. That's the effect that alcohol has on me and no one else felt it, but I did. And, um, my first sponsor taught me that obsession means an idea that overcomes all other ideas. And so it was not possible for me to overcome my preoccupation with alcohol on my own. And I want to read to you from our book. There is a solution because this was what my, this is what it looked like and sounded like for me. Um, I'm sorry, more about alcoholism on page 30. And, you know, I couldn't control it on my own. And I came into Alcoholics Anonymous um, from our sister program. I came in through the screen porch door through the Al-Anon family groups. And I heard a lot from the big book and I heard a lot of other recovering alcoholics share. And I started to suspect I might have a drinking problem. I also did fill out that little questionnaire, you know, that they gave me and I changed my answers to yes, to fewer than three, because I didn't want to have an alcohol problem. And I was like catching alcoholism from you. It's contagious, by the way, when you come into AA. And so this is what I heard. And this is what um, started to confront me on page 30. And I'm just going to change it to I because that applies to me when I when I read it that way. I was unwilling to admit I was a real alcoholic. I didn't want to think I was bodily, bodily and mentally different from you. Therefore, it was not surprising that my drinking career was characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that I could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, I could control and enjoy my drinking was my great obsession, and I was an abnormal drinker. The persistence of my illusion was astonishing. Many pursue this into the gates of insanity or death. I learned that I had to fully concede to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic. This was my first step in recovery. The delusion that I was like other people or presently would be had to be smashed. And then it goes on to to say other things that I did, every form of self-deception and experimentation. I tried to prove myself an exception to the rule. I tried hard and long to drink like other people. I tried to limit the drinks. You know, I thought I'm going to find a cute little cocktail that suits me. It'll be my signature drink. Hey, maybe bourbon. That's from Kentucky. I'm from Eastern Kentucky. That'll be charming. You know, this is all the stuff I did. And it was impossible for me. I couldn't control and drink and, and enjoy my drinking until the impossible became possible with step one. I admitted I was powerless over alcohol and that my life was totally unmanageable by me. You know, that was my first step in recovery, the only ever step I ever take perfectly. And when I hit that bottom with alcohol, and I was just like Bill, when he was at the bar, pounding his fist on the bar saying, how did it happen again? And I hit that bottom and had that gift of desperation that so many alcoholics talk about. And I just was crumpled up in the bed. Nowhere left to turn, emotionally defeated. I picked up the phone and I called, um... I did have a sponsor by that time and I called her and curiously enough, she, she didn't answer and she always picked up the phone, but she was out running errands. So I called my recovery buddy. Cause I did have a recovery buddy by this time, a, a beautiful recovery sister named Nikki. And she picked up the phone on the first ring. And I explained to her how I was feeling because this is the identification in Alcoholics Anonymous. And like it says in our story, freedom from bondage, it's not so much, how, it's not so much how much I drank, but it's how it's what happened when I did because Nikki's story with alcohol is a very different story. She was very low bottom. She was prostituted. She, um, you know, just had a very different experience on the streets with alcohol. But when I explained to her how I felt, she said, Ashley, that's exactly how I felt when I hit my bottom with alcohol. And so I went straight to the internet, you know, looked up a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous where I was visiting, you know, out of state somewhere, went to the meeting and they didn't have um, desire chips at this meeting. 
But coincidentally, you know, is it odd or is it God? There was someone there who was the husband of a colleague of mine and I couldn't place him. I was like, how do I know this person? It was so out of context. And he had with him his like 18 year medallion when his anniversary was also the anniversary of his mother's death. And he gave that to me as my, as my surrender, as my surrender chip, my desire chip. And I just always thought that was such a beautiful gesture of what the, the fellowship and the camaraderie is in Alcoholics Anonymous, that he would give me a medallion that was so laden with sentimentality and poignancy for him as my desire chip. And, um, you know, I have found it possible not to pick up a drink since that day with a complete surrender. And I have stayed stopped. And that's my higher power doing for me what I didn't even really want to do for myself because, you know, I, 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 I liked my drinking until my drinking didn't like me, you know, and the next thing that came became possible for me was finding this God of my own understanding, you know, and it talks so much and it, it makes these kind of coy references in the doctor's opinion, you know, um, my emotional problems piled up on me and became astonishingly difficult to solve. And then it starts to say, we work out our problems on an, on a spiritual plane. And it starts talking about, a psychic change, you know, it's, it's kind of sneaks up on us. And then it also says that we're doomed and it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, and then it goes on to say, and we agnostics that, um, you know, to find God or, or face an alcoholic death, these are not easy alternatives. And so it makes, it makes it, it makes me have the stark um, contrast between, you know, on what basis am I going to live? Is it references in step three? Am I going to live self will run riot and just on my own pro self propulsion? Or am I going to find a, a higher power of my own understanding? And one of the things that I cherish about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and our literature and our preamble and what was read from the pamphlet is that AA gives me and you and everyone who comes here and everyone who has been here for 46 years the dignity and the grace of a higher power of their own understanding. And that understanding is personal. It is individualistic and it is never up for criticism or commentary or contempt. And we are not allied with any sect or denomination or institution. And one of the assignments that I got from my sponsor, the last time I formally took step two was to go through the chapter to the agnostic and write down all of the references to higher power. And they're just beautiful and um, so wide ranging and, and, and sort of meditate on all these references and think about what they meant to me personally, so that I could deepen my own creative understanding and relationship with this higher power of my understanding, you know, and that's very important when I grew up the way that I grew up. And I want to tell you a little bit about, about my background you know, on page 18, it says that, you know, in alcoholism, it warps the lives of blameless children. And that was my experience. My great grandmother was a flop house street alcoholic who burned down the family business and murdered my great grandfather. Um, I have a great uncle who, and I'm going to talk about violence and sexual assault in my story. So please take care of yourself. My, 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 one of my great uncles, attempted infanticide and then killed himself. You know, I come from violence and trauma and dysfunction and untreated, undiagnosed mental illness. And my parents loved me very much and they were just not able to take care of me properly. And this included my parents buying and selling me back and forth to each other. You know, apparently I was worth $2,000 in the fifth grade because that's what my dad bought me for. And, um, you know, when my dad did try to see me when I lived with my mom, what it looked like was my mom would was so hostile to my dad. She hid the car in the barn, put me under the bed in the house, locked all the doors, pulled down the shades, turned off the lights. And my dad ran around the house screaming and cussing and raging and banging on the doors and breaking the windows with his elbow trying to find me. You know, that's what parenting looked like for me growing up. And so authority figures, where was God? Where were the people who were supposed to care for me? Finding a God of my understanding was a very big project in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so coming up with a loving spirit of the universe, something tender, something intimate that in step three, I could turn my will 
and my life over to the care of was, um, was tremendous, you know, and that was something that I, you know, it wasn't necessarily impossible, but it became possible because of the language in our, in our text, you know, and when it says, and we agnostics, the realm of the spirit is roomy and broad. It is all inclusive. It is open to all who earnestly seek. And then the part that's really important to me, um, where it talks about um, the stories in the back of the book. And it says on page 50, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking in the face of collapse and and despair in the face of total failure and their human resources. They found a new power, peace, happiness, and a sense of direction flowed into them. I mean, those kinds of assurances allowed me in step two to be confident that there was something that would care for me. And then I just want to read also from our text on page 55, deep down in every man, woman, and deep down in me, right? Deep down in me is the fundamental idea of a higher power. It may be obscured by calamity and my childhood was calamitous, you know, but in some form or another, it is there. Um, And then it goes on to say, it is the great reality that deep down within us that, that we found that higher power is the great reality deep down inside of me. And in the last analysis, it is only there that it may be found. And so what it meant is that higher power was not all these circumstances and situations and people, but it was an experience that I could have down inside. And so now I want to kind of transition and talk about, well, what are these experiences where what used to be impossible in my life became possible in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And it all has to do with relationship. You know, it all has to do with relationship. And, and in step eight, it says something so profound in our 12 and 12. It says um, um, that defective relations with other human beings have been the cause of all our woes, including our alcoholism. Defective relationships with other human beings have been the cause of all our woes, including our alcoholism. And so here I'm able, once I put down the drink and I stay stopped and I recover from, you know, the the physical, the obsession of the mind and the physical craving, and I start to straighten out mentally and physically, and I take the steps and I, you know, and I get relief from my defects of character in step six and step seven after doing my inventory in, in four and giving it away in five and I start to make my list in step seven and step eight, and I'm willing to make my amends in nine, and I start to grow um, in effectiveness and understanding in step 10, and my relationships start to straighten out. What are the, how do my relationships heal? And what has that looked like for me? And, you know, what is this, what does a spiritual awakening actually even mean? You know, in step 12, I just wanted to read When I've had a spiritual awakening, the most important meaning of it is that I'm now able to do, feel, and believe that which I previously could not do on my unaided strength and resources alone. So I'm just going to tell you some stories about what that looks like. Um, You know, my core belief about myself when I got here is that I was too damaged to heal. That I was too damaged to heal. And our fifth tradition talks about our, our primary spiritual aim And when I apply that primary spiritual aim to myself, like what is my personal fifth tradition, my primary spiritual aim is to heal, you know, it's to stay sober and then it's to heal. And when I heal myself with this great reality that my higher power is inside of me and cares for me, it allows me to start to heal in my relationships, you know, in those first relationships that are shockingly healed and it took time, they were not the first amends that I made, but the relationships that have healed in an extraordinary way are the relationships with my parents. Because when I made my step eight, you know, I did mine in an Al-Anon suggestion and I made three columns. The first column was I'm willing to make amends to the person right now. Column two was I'm willing to make my amends, but I'm a little nervous and I need to pray about it and read some literature and talk to my sponsor, but I'll get there. And the third column was not no, but hell no, (laughs) not making amends to that person ever. And I kept working the steps and eventually without my permission, you know, my mom and my pop 
and my dad migrated over to the first column and I'm willing to make my amends. And, you know, what I'm, I had nothing for which to make amends for my childhood because I was a blameless dependent child growing up in the dysfunction and hell of alcoholism. And it is not, it was not my fault to prevent my own child abuse or to prevent my own exploitation. What I was responsible for as an adult was the rage that I carried my reactivity, because once I became aware of the fact that I had my own disease and I became aware of the fact that there was a solution, I became responsible for treating my disease and the distortions in my own thinking. And so when I made my amends to my mom for the rage that I had carried toward her and for not accepting her limitations, our relationship became beautiful. It became beautiful. And today I'm able to accept the love my mother is capable of giving me. We're buddies. We hang out. She loves my partner. She, you know, my pop grills us steaks. And this isn't just a relationship that is um, where we tolerate each other. You know, we are politically wildly different. You know, I, she thinks my candidate is wacky. I know her candidate is wacky. Um, you know, but when I was speaking uh, at the last presidential election, because as it says in the 12th step, we AAs are active folk. Um, she came to hear me speak on behalf of my candidate. She showed up in a political space that is odious to her because she is proud of her daughter. And she came backstage. And after I spoke, she said, honey, you were perfect. They are so lucky to have you. You know, and my sponsor has taught me that tolerance doesn't mean gritting your teeth and burying it. It's like being drought resistant. You are unaffected. And I can be, you know, my mom is getting ready to engage in the career. Uh, she's doing a reunion thing that robbed me of my childhood. You know, she went out and did her career and literally left me alone for a year as a child um, with no caregiver. And she's getting ready to go do that thing again for a year, for, for some, for some period of time. And I said to her, I support you as an individual. I hope your needs are met. I hope you have fun. You know, the thing itself isn't something with which I want to engage, but I really hope you have a lot of fun and that this is a good experience for you in your life. Like we are able to, it's just a miracle what can happen in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and this is because I was willing to do the steps because I'm willing to learn about healing relationships through the traditions. So that's just one example of how the absolutely impossible has become possible. I mean, I hated my mother when I came into AA. When it was her birthday, I dreaded the approach of her birthday. And then all day long, I was in angst about trying to reach out to her because I just didn't want to. And then at 11 59, I would leave her a hurried, rushed voicemail and hang up as soon as I could. That's what it looked like, you know, and today it's like I go to the store early and pick out a loving card that reflects my affection and tenderness for her. So another story that I want to tell you is, um, you know, I obviously grew up with a lot of isolation. As I said, I, I, I lived alone for, for two years as a kid. And um, when I say that, I, I, I mean that very literally. There's a period at the end of that sentence. And my partner is a very social person. He had lots of bedrooms in his house growing up, but his brothers and he shared a bedroom because his parents wanted them to be close as boys and adults growing up. And when he and I met, he lived in what we would call a commune. They, he had flatmates or uh, housemates and, um, you know, his daughter lived in that flatmate with him, as did his daughter's mother, even though the, the mother and he had not been in relationship for many years. And this model, in case you're familiar with it, it's called nesting, where the child stays put and the parents rotate in and out so that the child has a stable, consistent home and doesn't switch places, but the parents get along for, to center the child's welfare. Totally radically different idea from, you know, the warped childhood that I had, right? So um, I meet my partner, and what do I do? I move into the commune with the child and the mother and the flatmates. And I have been the most isolated person 
And I've never lived in community like this before. But because of our first tradition, which states our common welfare should come first, you know, and the idea is that personal progress for the greatest number depends upon unity. And because I've learned about the, 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 the balance between autonomy and rights in tradition four, you know, with freedom comes responsibility. And because I've learned about how not to have opinions and be controversial, but also how to have voice and stand up for myself. So that's tradition 10, how to have voice and stand up for myself, but also not be controversial and have opinions about what other people are doing and how to mind my own business. And in tradition two, how to take part of an informed group conscience and sit around the kitchen table and make decisions in a collective and how to state my opinion, but then let it go and accept the outcome of what the group decides and how to participate collectively, which is part of concept four, and that my participation is a key to harmony. And if I don't participate, I'm letting myself become a victim. And that when I'm the minority opinion, which is concept five, I am obligated to speak up. I have a duty to speak up, to express my minority opinion. All of these things that I've learned from our legacies empowered me to step into a space and be a part as an American living in a commune in Germany with a man I had only met like three months before with his daughter and the daughter's mother, which I know sounds culturally so bizarre, but the impossible becomes possible. And to explain things, we were in one city, the mom works in another city. So she was only there part of the week and everybody has separate bedrooms. But the point is my childhood is nothing that I would ever want to repeat or inflict on another child. And today, knowing that I can do things differently and I'm an empowered woman with dignity and respect who is recovering in Alcoholics Anonymous and that I have these spiritual principles and guides by which to live. I am capable of doing things that were previously not only unheard of, not, not only impossible, but absolutely unheard of. And I have an amazing relationship with that child's mother. And you know what it's based on? Respect. It's based on respect. And she's a very safe person to me. And I just wanted to tell that story because, you know, it, as I've given you a sketch of my childhood and, and this is just, this is just how I roll in AA. Now, let me be clear. It is not always easy. I call my sponsor a lot. I talk to my outside help a lot and it is fully 100% the, 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 the traditions and the concepts that guide me in this. And there was a time when, um, after we were quarantined in Switzerland and we were going back to Berlin, we were trying to get our own place to stay. And, and the mom invited us to stay with her for a little while. And I didn't want to do that because in her place, there's not a, an adequate private area for me to take my step 11 every morning, which is an, a critical foundational part of my emotional sobriety that makes the impossible possible for me. And as I was thinking about this invitation to stay with her and the daughter, I was thinking about how to carve out my recovery area in her small apartment. And I felt overwhelmed because culturally this is normal for them. It's normal in terms of centering the welfare of the child. It's economically, you know, it makes sense. It, it, you know, doesn't use as many resources, which is a big part of our values. And I thought tradition too. right now, I'm being asked to take a part of an informed group conscience. And I have information about myself. I need space. I need privacy. I need to be able to wake up and have prayer and meditation. There's no area in which to do that. And then I thought concept four, I'm being asked to participate because participation is built into our structure. And if I don't participate, I'm allowing myself to be excluded and to feel like a victim. And then again, concept five, I'm the minority voice here. I'm the cultural minority and minority in other ways. And I have a duty and obligation to speak up. And then I thought about the concept that talks about traditional rights versus legal rights. They have legal rights over the child. I have a traditional right as her bonus mother, but it's an equal right to speak up. And all the other principles that came up and I spoke up and I said, I'm not comfortable with that. We need to have our own place. And we got our own place. So what I'm saying is I've had spiritual experiences as the result of the 12 steps. And then these other principles guide my decision-making moment to moment. 
So the other thing, kind of similarly based with, with family, where the impossible has become possible, is I was married for, um, I was in a relationship for 14 years, married for 10, and my God, I wanted out. I mean, I wanted out. I had reached the up with which I could not put. And I had done all the things that my sponsor at the time suggested. Stay until you can stay. You stay and become different. You know, be a, be a person of attraction rather than promotion consistent with our 11th tradition. You know, put those principles above personalities consistent with our 12th tradition. And... I, I, you know, after 14 years, I was just, I was just ready to go. And what happened was I had a dream and I had a dream in which I was spiritually drowning and there was actually water and I was drowning, but I realized consistent with what we talk about in that beautiful para that beautiful paragraph and we agnostics that the great reality is that my higher power is inside of me. And I realized in the deepest sense that although this, and the relationship had become very peaceful because I had stayed until I could stay. And I, I got to the point where I was cruising, you know, I was cruising and it worked in many ways. It looked good. I was very comfortable in his world. He didn't participate in my world at all, but I was just moving along and doing my thing. Nobody acted ugly. Nobody acted out. Everybody was faithful. I adored his family. You know, he loved my family. It all looked good and felt good in some ways, but spiritually I was very unfulfilled. We didn't share spiritual values, things like that. And in this dream, when I realized that I was spiritually dying, I realized I had to make a spiritual decision and that my higher power was either everything or my higher power was nothing. And I had to stake my life on my absolute core values and principles. And I had to make that bottom baseline decision about is that great reality inside of me or not? And can I let go of what little I have in order to have less or nothing with no guarantee that I'll ever have something again and trust that my higher power will hold my hand and that I will still somehow be full and trust that I will still somehow be full. And I staked my life on it and I let go and I let go. And you know what happened? Weeks after I made that decision, he came to me and said that he himself had reached the same conclusion. It was Again, is it odd or is it God? It was just uncanny. He came to me and he said, I understand what you've been talking about all these years. I've reached the same decision. And together with dignity and tenderness and so much affection, we closed our marriage together in an emotionally sober way. We actually went to the place where we got married and closed our marriage there on our 10th, literally the day of our 10th wedding anniversary. And we stood on the place where we got married and we redid our vows as chosen family, talking about what it would look like to still be in each other's lives and understanding full well that we both wanted the other person to eventually find new love and new happiness in that way further down the road. And, um, you know, I really used the slogans and the mottos of Alcoholics Anonymous, which are two different things, you know, because I had to let go of the need to know. I had to let go of the need to know what was going to happen next. And then uh, six weeks later, he started dating people <laughs> because he didn't have a program. He didn't have a sponsor. He didn't carry on with our outside help. And he just didn't know any better. You know, and I got to be a dignified woman in recovery and say, God bless you. You can still come home because he's not American and our home, I promised him would always still be our home and he could come and go as he pleased because this was part of my vow to him as chosen family. So he's dating people and still coming and going from our house. It was, I was, it was tough. It was tough. 
And then he came home and he had this funny look on his face, real funny look on his face. And I said, are you getting married? And he said, no. And I said, oh my God, I'm sorry for the, it's kind of crude language, but this is just what popped out of me. I said, are you knocked up? And he said, yeah. He and the woman he was dating had an unintended pregnancy. And I, he and I had chosen not to have children. And this was a big part of our value system. And the reason I'm telling you the story and why it fits with the impossible becomes possible is that this hit me in a very painful way because I had to let go of my old ideas, as it says in our book, that we had this shared value system. And I ended up wet and naked and sobbing on a hotel room floor in a cold, anonymous city, totally shattered. For some reason, this just hit me in my core. And one of my great friends in AA, who to me is a spiritual giant, was on the speakerphone talking to me. And he said, in these moments, Ashley, there is no meeting. There is no line from the book. There is no step. There's just your higher power and you. And what is it going to be? And once again, I had to go back to that great reality that deep inside of me is the fundamental idea of this love, of this higher power, and that it loves me in my brokenness, and that I am precious in my wayward journey, and that I am not alone. And I had to completely surrender, completely surrender the old idea make good on this impossible thing that we were going to be chosen family, even when the other one found new love, because guess what? He also asked me to be the godmother. He asked me to be the godmother. And you know what I said? I said, of course. And the impossible became possible. And I stopped crying and I got myself off that floor. And I was there five days after that baby was born. And I am great friends with his new wife, my successor, my wife-in-law. I love her. I respect her. We are comrades. You know, she, she'll, she'll call me and complain about him from time to time. And I'll tell my stories and she'll say, oh, he should just get easier wives because the impossible becomes possible in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, these improbable, unlikely relationships between women that are not supposed to happen in our society are totally possible with the spiritual values and principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it says at the beginning, of the 12 and 12 in the preface or the forward, excuse me, the 12 steps are a series of principles, spiritual in nature, which practiced as a way of life, expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become usefully and happily whole, usefully and happily whole, you know, and that, that is a lot of my experience. Um, I'm just looking for the time which I don't see. Got just over 11 minutes. Okay, thank you very much for that. So another part of my journey, you know, where the impossible has become possible is finding my voice, you know, is finding my voice, which I didn't have a voice growing up, which is the definition of crazy making, like in an alcoholic home with sex, sexual abuse and violence. And, you know, the kind of childhood I had was, The police would come and then I would go out to the front porch as they were leaving, wondering why they weren't taking me with them. Like, hello, there's something very wrong here. And um, I would try to say, this is happening. And the adults in my life would say, no, it's not. And that is that mismatch is literally the definition of creating insanity inside a child's brain. And so my voice was really squashed. And Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me how to have a voice in a way that allows me to stand for something without standing against my fellows. So I start to learn in my step four, you know, where I step on the toes of my fellows and they retaliate, where I set into motion trains of circumstance I feel I don't deserve. I start to learn in six and seven how, you know, when there's something wrong with me, I have Uh, a disturbance when there's when I'm disturbed by something there's something wrong with me and as my sponsor says you know these disturbances I experience are actually divine disturbances you know that these are all opportunities and I learn in step 10 in the 12 and 12 
you know, to look very deeply and closely at my motives when I'm speaking up? Is it a, you know, secret um, agenda for character assassination? You know, am I trying to manipulate and control? I learn in step 12, in the 12 and 12 about, am I being dependent? Am I, am I being um, dominant? But what I also really learn, and if you've never taken a look at it, I learn in the 12th concept, the general warranties of the conference. And this is really about, for me, how to learn how to speak up and have voice in relationship, in our business meetings, in society. How to do that without being personally punitive, you know, without being mean, as we sometimes say, mean what you say, say what you mean, but don't say it mean how to do it without being controversial. Like I can have conflict because conflict is a natural part of life, but without being controversial about it and how to have information. Because sometimes I know more than another person, but that doesn't make make me a know-it-all. I just have more information that they do at this time. And how to do that without placing myself in unqualified authority over them or without letting another person put themselves in unqualified authority over me. And these are things I learned from the 12th concept and the general warranties of the conference. And I want to give you an example of something that just happened in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, because if we're family, we need to work shit out in a family way, you know, and this was not easy. I was recently at a conference. And someone was sharing from the podium. And he was make he was sharing on step six and seven. And he was saying about step the seventh step prayer, that in the seventh step prayer, you know, we say, My higher power, now take all of me, good and bad. And, you know, I, I was really getting a lot out of his share. And he said that in, in that prayer, I don't know what's good about me or bad about me. I don't have that discernment. I just say, HP, take it all, you know, take it all. And then he went on to say, because you know, I used to think that crack. And then he used a very pejorative, old-fashioned term for prostituted women. I used to think that crack and mm, were good. And then I found out they were bad. And the room just laughed. Big, big, big laugh. Big laugh. And I'm thinking, they're not bad. Your behavior was bad. Your behavior was bad. And so I was in the receiving line afterwards to thank him for his talk. And I said, hey, um, I would love to connect with you about your talk. There was something that stood out to me. And, you know, when I'm in the receiving line and someone says that, I naturally think that there was something I said that was helpful. And so when I connected with him, you know, he said, anything I can do to be helpful. And I was like, oh, dude, you have no idea what's coming. (laughs) This isn't about complimenting you. This is about um, giving you social information. And the point is, you know, the word that he used is like saying the R word for, for folks who live with disabilities. It's not a, um, an appropriate word anymore. And he was not able to hear me um, when I spoke with him. And I'm not going to go into the details because it's not what was said or who said it. Excuse me. It's not about who said it. It's about what was said. And that's one of the ways that we practice principles above personalities. But the point is, he did tell me he has told this joke hundreds of times in Alcoholics Anonymous. And no one has ever been brave enough to speak up and tell him that it is perhaps an inappropriate joke. And that I was the only one with the courage to say something to him. And although he was very insulting to me, he did say he would take a look at it. And my point is, if I had not had those, that concept five about how the minority voice in Alcoholics Anonymous has a duty and an obligation to speak up and the general warranties of the conference, I never would have had the courage. And because of this journey from voicelessness and the family disease of alcoholism to being a woman with voice in AA, to say something to a man who makes a really inappropriate joke about women trapped in sexual exploitation and drunk men who pay them. So I wanted to tell that story. And for anyone who tells those kinds of jokes from the podium, knock it off. They're not funny. 
they're not funny. And there are plenty of people in AA who have been in that position. So that was that story. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is that, um, you know, I basically, in terms of saying the impossible becomes possible, is that when I got here, I, I just kind of wanted to die, you know, and that was a part of my story from the time I was in early high school. And I know that that's a part of a lot of people's story, but that's the kind of despair and pain with which I lived. You know, I'm definitely an alcoholic and the drink problem has been solved. But as it says in the doctor's opinion, you know, my emotional problems piled up on me and became astonishingly difficult to solve. And I had a lot of ideation about the different ways that I just wanted the pain to stop. And the greatest thing perhaps that has become possible for me is the robustness and the vitality and the pleasure of my life as a result of recovery and the joy that is that is available here for us as we trudge this road of happy destiny. And when I checked in with my sponsor today, you know, she said, as she is so want to emphasize, we are not a glum lot. We are sure that higher power wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. We avoid the deliberate manufacture of misery. And we align ourselves with higher powers will. And if higher powers will is for us to be happy, joyous, and free, then I, you know, need to look for opportunities to be happy, you know, and that's like rewiring my brain after the kind of past that I have had. And that's really kind of the great, that's the great thing that has become possible for me after, you know, after the tough after the tough past. And so I'm going to close with um, the family afterward on page 124. Um, Henry Ford once made a wise remark to the effect that experience is the thing of supreme value in life. This is true only if one is willing to turn the past to good account. We grow by our willingness to face and rectify errors and convert them into assets. That's important line to me. I grow by my willingness to face and rectify my errors and convert them into assets. My past thus becomes the principal asset of the family and frequently it is the only one. My painful past may be of infinite value to other families still struggling with their problem. We think each family which has been relieved owes something to those who have not. And when the occasion requires, each member of it should be only too willing to bring former mistakes, no matter how grievous, out of their hiding places. Showing others who suffer how I was given help is the very thing which makes life so worthwhile. And then this is the big doozy line. Cling to the thought that in God's hands, my dark past is the greatest possession I have, the key to life and happiness for others. With it, I can avert death and misery for them. You know, I hope this was helpful to someone in some way. It's really just my story of how I previously couldn't do things that I'm now capable of doing because of God's mercy and grace and the 36 spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with, and we, we with you in fellowship and community today and peace be with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.